Okay, I would like to start a little bit different today, actually. While I just walked up, um, there are people providing me with some plastic cups, either blue cup or yellow cup. And there is just one cup for every second person of you. I'm just going to give them a little bit of time to spread the cups to you. If you're currently sitting on your own, it'd probably be best to partner up with someone else who's sitting on their own. It's a good opportunity to get to know each other, maybe meet a beautiful girl after all. Okay, once you have a plastic cup, um, just hold on there for a second. Because what I would like you to do is have a read through the instruction sheets that are in the cup. But please don't show these instructions to the person sitting next to you on the left. Please also don't tell them what it says on the instructions. I'll just give you a few moments to do so. And for everyone else who doesn't have a plastic cup yet, let me tell you what is about to happen. For those people without the plastic cup, your partner on the left or your neighbor on the no, your neighbor on the right actually, will in a minute, once I tell him or her to do so, place that plastic cup over your right ear and start talking to you. Yes, that's on purpose, and I'll be talking to you at the same time. Okay. Um, does everyone have a plastic cup? I think everyone has a plastic cup. So they will be talking to you at the same time. Now, you don't have to participate in this if you're completely uncomfortable with the idea of a possible stranger getting this close to you or talking to you via a plastic cup. That's okay. You don't have to participate. However, I hope that um, if you could bear with me in this experiment, you'll see that what's initially a little bit of an uncomfortable ask will turn out to be quite a valuable experience. Okay? So now, if everyone has read the instructions, could I please ask you to move the plastic cups over your neighbor on the left's ear and start talking to them as outlined on the instructions? Okay. Right. I will be using this time just to tell you a tiny little bit more about myself. As you've already heard, I'm a clinical psychologist and I've worked in this country for the last year and a half. Um, prior to this, I worked in the United Kingdom, which is also where I received all my training and degrees. Actually, what we're doing right now is also something that I did during my training. I'm very passionate about mental health care, and although it's actually not the most obvious career choice here in Nigeria. So I feel over the last year and a half, I've heard it all, from you're wasting your potential to you must be just as mad as the people that you treat to you will have nothing to do here. Well, it turns out that there's actually quite a lot to do here. Because in this chaos of Nigeria and in this chaos of the current mental health service system in Nigeria, or the lack thereof, lies endless opportunity to create and develop something very meaningful and unique to us. Okay, I'm going to ask you to stop here. I don't know whether that worked, but I'm going to ask you to stop. If you ever, haven't already done so, please remove the plastic cup from your neighbor's ear now. Thank you. Obviously, I would like to hear about everyone's experience of this. Um, and I would also like to reverse this experiment so that everyone gets to feel like uh, what it's like to hear a voice through a plastic cup while I'm talking to them. But I, I guess I have to ask you to do this in your own time, maybe at home, maybe as a family activity later on tonight or tomorrow. But let me just talk you through what should have happened here. While I was talking to you and telling you just a very short uh, bio about myself, there was another voice talking to you. And initially, this voice was saying nice things like, you're shining, you're looking really good. But then this voice started saying less nice things like, you're mad. Are you hearing me? You're mad. Or, don't listen to her. She's stupid. She wants to harm you. Or, you're stupid. Why don't you just go home? You can't do this. You may have been initially quite shocked by this, and you may have tried to move away from that noise or from the car. You may have also realized that the voice was increasingly getting louder, and at the end it would have been difficult to concentrate on what I was saying. 
altogether probably a rather uncomfortable and unusual experience. Now I would like to ask you all this. If this was your everyday experience, initially just for one day, but then for days and weeks and months, what would you do? And what would you do first? Would you pray? Would you tell anyone about it? Would you try and get help? And where would you go to get help? This is what it feels like for many people who hear voices because they suffer with mental health care professionals called psychosis, a mental state that is characterized by the loss of contact with reality and which is the key feature in many severe um, mental illnesses such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder with psychotic features or psychotic depression. Although this was obviously a very, very brief and simplified insight because people who suffer from psychosis often hear more than just one voice and their voices start becoming increasingly hostile towards them, asking them to harm themselves. And they may also experience several other severe symptoms. Now, mental illnesses have always existed, but there are three main theories to explain their origin. There is the supernatural theory, which basically says or attributes mental illness to sins or curses or the possession by evil spirits or the displeasure by gods. There is also the somatogenic theory or the biological theory, which attributes mental illness to physical dysfunctioning. So it basically says that mental illness results because of illness or because of brain damage or because of genetic inheritance. And then there's the psycho psychogenic or psychological theory which attributes mental illness to stressful or traumatic experiences, or because of difficulties with learning or perception or thinking. Now these theories have always existed, and they have largely remained the same over the last 9,000 years. As times they have coexisted, and as times they have recycled. But much more importantly, it's depending on which of these theories the specific culture believed in that has determined the treatment of individuals with mental illness. In the Western world, a more humanitarian view of mental illness was only derived in the early 18th and 19th century. And today, um, beliefs are mostly based on a mix between the biological and the psychological theory, or what we call the biopsychosocial model. So while an individual may have a genetic predisposition for a certain mental illness, there also needs to be a bit of psychological stress and other social factors present to be present before that illness develops. And then treatment is also usually based on both biological, so something like medication, drugs, and psychological theory, which is much more what I think what people here know as psychoanalysis or psychological therapy or talking therapy. Now, in Nigeria, the dominant narrative of mental illness is based on supernatural theory with a wide acceptance and practice of traditional or faith-based approaches to mental illness. And this could include praying or confession of sins or driving out of evil demons or spirits, sometimes by force. But these practices actually account for 70% of all mental health care delivery in this country. As Sangundele pointed out in his talk, talk earlier this year, Stigma and shame are so far-reaching in Nigeria. Stigma and shame around mental health. And they're partly maintained by some very unhelpful generational and sociocultural beliefs, such as the African masculinity concept, or the belief that these illnesses are all Oibo, white people's diseases that somehow are not applicable to Africans, or at least not Nigerians. And stigma, although it's universal, is often to be is often believed to be the result of a lack of education with a solution to be found in taking over what we know works in the West. Now, I'm very aware that despite my very traditional Abriba first name, Abariba being a village at Abia State in Nigeria, and my Igbo surname, to many of you, I too look like an Oibo woman, or at most yellow. Um, but today, I'm actually not here to educate you or to suggest that the answer to mental health care in Nigeria lies in taking over what we know works in the Western world. In fact, I actually think that this, or what I call the copy and paste approach, 
is not a solution at all, and that it might even be harmful to many Nigerians suffering from mental illness, both here and abroad. I believe this partly because we've already tried it, but with very limited success. Western models of psychiatric um, health care or service delivery were introduced in Nigeria in the early 20th centuries by the British colonial government. And not undermining all the good that these services have done, their sustainability has been a real problem. So today there's actually a severe lack of such services, institutions and professionals. professionals. Further to that, research in Nigeria has not only repeatedly shown that Nigerians prefer a traditional approach to mental health care, but also that the attribution of mental illness to supernatural beliefs is not only held by uneducated Nigerians, but that many educated Nigerians also firmly hold this belief. And this really signifies the influence of cultural notions in spite of increased access to Western or modern learning and education. And we know that culture matters. We know that culture matters when it comes to health and mental health. From cultural psychological research, we know that there are significant differences across all psychological domains, including thinking and learning and perception, and that there are also significant cultural differences in the perception of self. The problem is that Western models of um, mental health care are based on research conducted in Western populations. And even when this research looks or includes other populations, these are hardly representative of the average Nigerian living in Nigeria. Also, in Western models, the assessment, the diagnosis, and the treatment are based on the beliefs of Western people. And these can be radically at odds with the beliefs and values of non-Western populations. And that might actually create a crisis situation um, for individuals not holding or not represented by these claims. Let me give you an example of that from my own practice. Not too long ago, I was discussing a clinical case with some of my colleagues in England. We were discussing a young woman who was experiencing severe anxiety and depression in the context of several addictions, including alcohol, drugs, but also pornography. Now, for the parents of this young woman, the answer to all of her difficulties, including her mental health difficulties, so the anxiety and the depression, and her addictions, but especially to the pornography, um, was female genital mutilation, FGM. Now, the young lady come from a, came from a community and a family where this practice was actually still very, um, very much practiced on an everyday basis, and actually she was the only female in her family who didn't have that procedure done in childhood. So, one could say FGM is wrong, it's a human rights violation, case closed. But it's not actually about FGM here. It could have been equally about arranged marriage or beating as a form of parental punishment. Really, so disregarding our own views on FGM for a minute, for this young female who, as I said, came from a community and a family where this practice was still rightly, well, we, um, done, and for whom this practice was actually in part interlinked with her cultural identity and her identity as a woman, the case wasn't just closed. What I'm really trying to illustrate here is that the unique narratives that cultures and communities hold, including the unique narratives around health and mental health, are important because those represent their unique values and beliefs and um, constructed identities. So one cannot simply dismiss them. Ultimately, Western models of mental health care were in itself constructed in a social moment and are just in, as inherently vulnerable and unstable as other constructs. But don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the West is bad or Western models of mental health care don't work or they don't work here. But what I'm saying is they need to be adequately adapted to work here. I'm also not saying that all traditional approaches work or are great. Again, these two um, shouldn't cause any greater physical or emotional harm than they do good. Yet I'm wondering this, and my slides went a little bit ahead of me. I'm wondering whether knowledge is essentially the product of the Western world. 
And how can we tell that knowledge is legitimate? And does knowledge equal truth? And what is truth? Well, I don't have the answer to any of these questions. I don't believe that truth is ultimately the preservation of just one culture. So for the future of mental health care in Nigeria, I believe in a both-and approach, in which both Western or more global models of mental health care and traditional or more local models of mental health care not only coexist, but work together and learn from each other. And that's not the current status quo in which everyone seems to be doing whatever they want. No. I think for the future of mental health care, we must realize, first of all, that mental health is important. It's important for the well-being and functioning of every single Nigerian. And it's not just about how we feel, but it also affects the way we relate with each other and how we see the world. So the consequences of poor mental health will ultimately also affect our families, our communities, and our economy, and our society and country as a whole. So we must also realize that we need adequate policy and regulation around mental health and mental health care. And we need to realize that we need investment. Investment into what works, finding out what works here, both in terms of global approaches and more local or traditional approaches. More global approaches are currently looking into the advancement and aid of technology into the delivery of mental health care. I don't think we can really ignore that because it could also provide solution for um, the accessibility or the lack of current lack of accessibility of mental health services in more rural areas in Nigeria. On the other hand, the worldviews of the Igbos, the Yorubas, and many other Nigerian tribes hold yet untapped wisdom and knowledge about human experience, including health and mental health. And the storytelling rituals of the Igbo alone represent a vast opportunity for non-invasive, holistic psychological interventions. One that might ultimately save us all when technology fails or takes over the world completely. So, my hope is that in that alternate verse of mental health care in Nigeria, any individual that may have an unusual experience, like those that I made you feel at the beginning of this talk, will have access to a service that is both evidence-based and effective, as well as true to his or her beliefs and origins. Thank you.